Welcome to the RiskAdvisor.com podcast. I'm Sal LaFreury, and I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Jim Henry. Today's topic, we're going to talk about secure private cellular networks. Unlike the internet, a communications utility that was built around and for security, something we haven't seen in the past. Uh, and we had uh, our guests today, uh, we're on our past show, and uh, where we talked about the history of the internet regarding security. We talked about old dedicated analog lines, how to moving from, you know, to the web for ease of use, uh, some of the issues and problems that that developed. And now we get into convergence into private cellular networks. But exactly what is that going to entail? So, Jim, what do you think? Private cellular networks, next step, next step in technology here? Well, I think we we need to keep all the good that the internet gave us in efficiencies and scale, but we definitely need to solve the security problems and yet again maintain the capacity. And uh, technology uh, has been has been moving along and the cellular back uh, backbones which are now used for uh, for keeping up systems uh, like uh, like nine one one have uh, have become uh, far more reliable, but the great thing about uh, you know the private networks is um, you know we can we can solve a lot of these problems that we were talking about you know or getting into on the you know on the first show and we'll reiterate uh, we'll reiterate here you know as a lead in here to what uh, secure the secure networks mean and and how this really can be uh, the next utility going forward so. With that, joining us today via Skype is uh, Pierre Bojek, who has spent 30 years as a security consultant and innovator through his experience with the RAND Corporation, the U.S. State Department, ADT Tyco Security, High Security, Wallace International, Secure State, and Boone Needham. Currently, Pierre is the CTO and founder of ESI Convergent. Uh, also with us today via Skype is Joe Pinter. Uh, Joe is the CIO for both ESI Convergent and Secure PCN, which stands for Private Cellular Network. And he also has been a senior level uh, technology consultant for over 20 years with demonstrated experience in almost every aspect of information and telecommunications field. He has worked across multiple domains, including law enforcement, municipal government, court operations, as well as Corporate environments such as global manufacturing, financial services, insurance, and healthcare. Welcome to you both. So, before we talk about secure, uh, about private cellular networks, let's talk about the issues that CEOs struggle with when they have to decide on issues such as uh, power struggle between their IT departments and security, uh, mass use of IT with uh, no more hardwiring. The whole Alexa issue of are you listening and uh, are these devices hackable? And these are all the things that are driving the CEOs crazy now, trying to, again, maintain the, the efficiencies and the connectivity, you know, that the Internet has brought. But we've got to deal with these other, other challenges. So how's that platform going to do that? Okay, I want to set up that really answer with uh, just a couple comments. And then I have Joe basically just, you know, because he, he's, the, he's the author of a lot of this. So. You know, we just have to understand that uh, from from really the, the early or say mid two thousands or, or and late two thousands to today, um, or the you know the first part of the excuse me the first ten years of the two thousands, you've seen the proliferation of devices that are connected. Right, right now today we may have around seventy four billion devices connected, um, probably a hundred and some odd billion that are not, and really exponentially exponential growth of those connected devices from, you know, from sensors all the way to cameras, right? So no matter what, well, this leads to these issues we're talking about in terms of, you know, IT and physical security and converged systems, right? Of all these connected systems, now, you know, from an IT physical security perspective, this is putting everything into that domain. So, so Joe, you know, that's that's kind of the world you're living in. And this is, you, you came up with some incredible technology. So... Yep. So, um, in, in doing a lot of uh, in a lot of security uh, de- applications where we had customers with cameras on the edge, uh, typically that was they would throw a cradle point in um, a police department that needs to watch a house. We put a cradle point in. We hook that camera directly to the internet. The police can just go in and look at that. 
The only downside to that is everybody else in the world can look at it as well. And you have passwords. You have methods to secure it on the internet, which Pierre has gone into on the previous podcast. But the problem we had was is that now you never know who's making the IP stack for these devices. You never know what operating system they're running. You don't know anything about the actual physical, the ability of that device to be cybersecurity secure. So um, we've had some instances where municipalities have had cameras online on uh, poles and in traffic intersections where they got hacked um, just before large events. Uh, there was a pretty famous one where cameras got hacked right before a large event and bought and replaced cameras all at once because they were just wide open on the Internet, port 80. So um, a lot of these customers have come to us and saying, hey, you know, I don't know what I don't know. You know, we have these DVRs. Who knows what operating system can this participate in a distributed denial of service attack? Can this do anything? So the idea that we came up with out of a, just out of need was, let's just take them off the internet. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to make a deal with the uh, cellular telephone companies to get us a private network to actually give us an RFC 1918, which is uh, similar if you have a Linksys router at home or you have anything running on the home, you'll notice you have a 192.168.0.1 address. Okay, you realize you're talking Chinese, right? (laughs) Okay. You realize you're talking Chinese. Okay. (laughs) Because the average person ain't going to understand the (laughs) 198.20.123.16. I think just about everybody's logged into the router, but I'll... uh, I'll, I'll, I'll I got enough trouble working a dimmer switch in my fucking house. Okay. (laughs) Okay. okay. Let's, let's take it down a notch. All right. We'll take it. We'll take it back. All right. We've, what we've done is we've decided to take devices completely off of the internet. Uh, we've uh, worked with uh, large cellular carriers to get private, non routable protocols that are off the internet. So um, you'll end up with what we call a secure PC on appliance, an appliance that acts similar to any other cellular device, except for the fact that it is un touchable from the internet. So these devices will have a private encrypted end-to-end encrypted road from your device to your data center without any ability for zero-day vulnerability to, to be affected by it. Because uh, just quite frankly, somebody sitting in China can't can't even ping it. They can't get to it. So the device is private. And part of, and part of this, and I think this is, you know, let's let's kind of dumb it down to a certain degree even more, is the fact that with all the devices that were in the domain of physical security and IT, they were looking at this going, well, wait a minute. Okay, so I'm connecting all these devices to the, to the, to the internet, to the network, right? And um, basically, I don't have a way to secure all of that, right, where I have firewalls to secure it. Um, there's a potential for someone like a nation state or of some hacker. I would just say nation state hacker to, we'll say, infiltrate that, that stream of communication. And we call that a man in the middle attack, right? Somebody who could actually get to sniff the IP address, right? And actually get into the communication path of, 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 that, of that device. That's where it becomes dangerous because here's what, what happens, right? This is what happened to, to, Louisiana, to New Orleans, right? Just recently. New Orleans... Um, we had a hacker who actually connected into their access control system and was able to get through the access control system to their network. And what happened after that is they actually were able to, to establish ransomware. And that's a whole conversation in and of itself, right? Ransomware was able to you know, be, be distributed into their network and lock everything down and we we'll call it crypt, encrypt everything. So, so encrypt, so go ahead. Yes. Yeah, and, and another thing they'll do a lot of times is and when these devices are accessible from the internet, even if you have a firewall out there, um, the zero-day vulnerability is a vulnerability that's just not known about yet. Uh, nobody's figured it out. Nobody, It's not documented yet. So zero-day means that it's always been in there. When the uh, NSA got hacked by the shadow brokers, they found out that the NSA was keeping zero-day vulnerabilities secret. They were holding on to them and using them as for a toolkit. So the... Inclusion of a private cellular network basically eliminates the zero-day vulnerability because it's, you just can't get to it to start attacking it. And that land and expand is gone. Once I break through that one little camera, I can't expand out. So being on a private encrypted network, there's no, there's no sideways movement at all either. Would this be around the same time historically that we started looking at uh, in my time doing consulting for the Department of uh, Justice and Department of Defense, was we were look we started looking at asymmetric threats, 
was this stuff that was considered under the asymmetric? Yes. So if you look at asymmetric threats, it was tied to if we if we looked at you know the MANA infrastructure, right, to ensure that we could create a private uh, a, a private um, communication platform for six man teams, right? So we, we for for ground forces, right? So that they could actually create segmented communication protocol uh, with the tanks, right? Uh, converging tank command with 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 light infantry and air, air cover. And that had a secured network that was traveling with them, right? So you hit, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what we've created, but created in a way that was much more affordable, much more structured in regards to specifically addressing the communication platform of cellular. For started, we were creating our own network that was portable, right? So we call it an enclave. An enclave was created, and that's the term they use to exactly what I explained. We created an enclave, which basically was exactly that, the, the communication enclave that we could travel with and it becoming secure that no one else could use. No one else could hack because they couldn't see it. Okay. We're going to take it just a, a real quick break. One of the things I do want to mention, we want to apologize that some of the audio seems a little bit difficult uh, coming in. We got the, we're actually experiencing lightning storms around here. So that may be having some effect on the audio. Our guests are coming in via Skype, but uh, in any event, we just want to remind you that you are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and myself, Sal Lafreri. We're going to invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with either of us or both of us, please, again, once again, go to theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So as we get into segment two, I think the I think we've lined up the fact that we really want to talk now about secure PCN and get into it and talk about you know so what is it and how does it work? So secure PCN um, it eliminates the need for a private circuit. Before secure PCN, if you wanted to guarantee the security between let's say a card reader in a parking garage and your main data center you would have to pull wire. You'd have to pull wire or fiber or some other means of guaranteeing that that was private. Uh, to put it on the internet or to put it on, on any other type of network involved exposing it to the internet in some way. So uh, what Secure PCN does is it allows us to have an encrypted, secure method of leveraging the cellular network to facilitate that communication between that card reader and that panel or that air handler unit and the cloud provider who's monitoring that for you. Or any type of file is to uh, communicate securely machine to machine. Um, this is not an internet product at all. It is a private machine to machine network. How do IT departments view this? Do they see this as a, uh, a, a great solution? Do they see it as a threat? Do they see it as both? I don't think they would see it as a threat at all. Uh, just given the example in the last one of the target breach, right? If that air handler unit had been communicating back to its provider was secure PCN, it would have not been able to communicate with anything else on the network. I'm sure the IT department just allowed that out to the internet because that's what needed to happen. And they were just able to infiltrate that unit. If secure PCN had been there, uh, the IT department wouldn't have had to worry about it. They would have opened up no firewall rules. They It would have been segmented from their network. So even if uh, anything was to happen with the provider's network, that secured communication would, would guarantee it be segmented from their network. Yeah, so I kind of think I think I think it could be used in a in a million different ways. I think initially there may be some uh, you know some pushback because you know like the old the hardwired security guy uh, physical security people that we were you know we were apprehensive and skeptical of uh, you know of the of the internet and using the internet for security when it first came along, and I can mm -hmm. certainly mm -hmm. see some you know some IT. You know, folk, uh, you know, looking at this saying, well, wait a minute, I know what I know. And, and yeah, we got problems here that we need to fix, but uh, I'm hesitant to jump on something else. But I think once they understand the benefits that it's bringing and the security issues that it is solving, 
I think that they will uh, they will embrace that maybe initially, you know, for uh, for redundancy, you know, to have hybrid networks, which is a combination or or using the uh, the private cellular network as a backup in case their network does go down. But I think over time, this will uh, you know this will prove itself, and the IT um, you know the IT industry you know will wrap their arms around this going forward. I, I actually got a question, Joe. It we were talking earlier on an earlier show, and then we were, a little earlier we were talking about it with the Internet of Things and the fact that a lot of the devices that were put up were security wasn't built into it. So as a guy who has enough trouble running a dimmer switch, how do you convince me that the all of these devices that we now want to hang on a cellular network, forget about the internet, now i got to learn about a cellular network, how are those devices that we're going to put on it secure? Do we not have the same problem? Well, th- th- those devices very well could have a, a zero-day vulnerability. Uh, but it doesn't matter because nothing can get to it. Even if they were trying to talk out, let's say they're trying to phone home to China, um, similar to what the uh, some of those DVRs. There was there was a, a brand of DVRs that were kind of phoning home. That's where people were using them to take part in an attack. You can't get to them. So when when you're on the uh, secure PCN network, first of all, our our endpoint devices are 100% denied by default. We only allow what is needed to get the job done. So if that IoT device that you have in your location, it all, it, we are only allowing it to do exactly what its job is. And if it starts coloring outside of those lines at all, our monitoring platform picks that up and we even let you know about that. We say, hey, this unit, we have a unit sitting on this site that's doing something it's not supposed to. It's misbehaving. Yeah, and I think, I think to answer, I'd add to this answer is that because we've made it, we've simplified it and made it so that it is easy for you to deploy we can spin one of these networks up in 20 minutes. So once you've received the, the, the device, we've already pre-configured because we've asked, asked questions on what you actually are connected to, what you're doing, how you're doing it. We actually have pre-configured this, so it is easy. I think you're right on target, Sally. That I think most people don't want to make it difficult because, frankly, the, the, what, why this is so important is that it is, A, affordable, B, it's easy to connect, and, the, and lastly, it is completely secure. And so that's why we built in security into the, the communication platform, not just in the device, but also the stream to, of pipe, the pipe that is, can, is, is secure machine to machine. So there's, you know, at the end of the day, that's really the holy grail. That's what people have been looking for. They've been asking, you know, it all started with, with ESI being asked a thousand times, how do we do this? And, you know, as a consulting firm, we were like, on oh, enough, we got to figure out the solution. And, and you know, when Joe and I got together with our team and we just realized, well, this is a marriage made in heaven. And so we came together and our organizations came together and the solution was created. Um, and he'd been using it for years already. You know, he'd been creating, putting this on camera poles and, and communicating this way for years. And he just created a, a, a much more robust process. And we just backed it up and said, we're on, we're on board. You know, in one in a, and again in in, a, in in one of the pre-production meetings, we were talking about it. And one of the things that stood out in my mind was when we, were, when we were talking about benefits, and you said, "Well, there's a cost savings." And I asked, "Okay, so what would it cost?" And you said, "Well, in one particular situation, you know, you, you're saving on wiring, where an organization, a facility, was spending, I think you said something like three million dollars for wiring, where they could have got away with thirty-five thousand. Correct. Correct. Joe, you want to talk to that? That's Right. Yeah, and in, in the in the private fiber business, uh, in in any of those circuits, the things you hate are bodies of water, highways, and railroad tracks. Railroad tracks being the worst. And this particular customer had a facility on the other side of a railroad track, so they were going to have to bore underneath railroad tracks in order to get that private connectivity that would meet their security needs to get across that that railroad track. So setting up the the uh, secure PCN devices out there and creating that AES two fifty six private tunnel between all of those devices, 100% encrypted, uh, we were able to meet their security needs and do it for a fraction of what it was going to cost. Hey, Joe, can you explain AS-256 so they understand what that means? Current, that is the current uh, encryption standard that is uh, out there for everything. And, and, uh, that is the, the current highest level of uh, encryption that is supported. And, right. and, and, it's, and it's hardware accelerated with us, so it's very fast. 
one other point I, I I think is worthy in this segment to reference is that you know we talk about you know devices that uh, may not necessarily be built with the the level of cyber uh, health and and hardening that uh, that is needed nowadays. I would think those manufacturers would be would be welcoming this because, like I say, even if their devices, you know, have some uh, wayward tendencies, if they're going on a secure private cellular network, they can't get out there and do that damage. So right now, there's a there's a lot more onus on manufacturers of uh, security edge devices, you know, to be you know to be hardening their product to basically insulate themselves from from doing all the wayward things that you can do on the, uh, you know, on the internet. So when we get into segment three here, we'll, we'll do a deeper dive on this uh, solution uh, of uh, secure private cellular networks and um, whether this actually is going to be a, uh, the standard, the way that uh, the internet public internet has been now for, for effectively the past, uh, you know, the past 20 years. So you are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by myself, Jim Henry, and Sal Lafrere. We invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or more of, of us speak at a, a, or both of us, I should say, speak at an upcoming event and would like to consult with us, please go to our web page at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So, segment three, will secure private cellular networks be a standard or actually a requirement that uh, they actually may move into the area of requirements that would be compliance required, whether for specs or for something beyond that? So, Pierre, that's your world that you come from there in consulting. Do you think you can actually uh, drive it to that point? So, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that this also plays into what Joe, you know, has been dealing with as well in regards to, you know, the the, the regulated market, the, the, the compliance-based world, right, in terms of liability. Um, you know, we all been trying to defer liability, you know, for years, right, Try, trying to get it off our plate. Oh, my God, no, I don't want to hold on into any of this risk, right? I, I got to try to defer it. Well, unfortunately, you know, over the years, you know, we've seen, you know, many different compliances be created, many different standards created. Uh, ISO, right, in the manufacturing world, and you've got um, NERC SIP in the in the energy world. I mean, there's so many PCI in the in the in the in the retail world, right? Um, health HIPAA right, for the healthcare world, and all of these were created to really try to protect data, right? Protect people's uh, uh, privacy and data. And, and frankly, you know, it also for to to protect infrastructure from you know being hacked, being and this is all internet related, right? All network related. Well, all of a sudden now you get all this now physical security devices now on that network, and they are all potential vulnerabilities or potential we call threat uh, threat vectors, right? They're they're now on that table of risk. So what ends up happening is that people are going, well, okay, wait a minute. So what, right? I mean, what does it matter if, uh, uh, you know, we got uh, an unsecured network for these devices? Well, then we start seeing, you know, attacks and ransomware. We start seeing networks being locked down and, and people are bribing, you know, corporations for, look, if I, I'll get your network up, but, but you got to pay me, you know, uh, you know $15,000, $20,000, a million dollars to get it back, the data back. And so all of a sudden now this is a risk that it's intolerable. We can't have that happen, right? Or data is being stolen, and you know we've gotten immune to that already. But the reality is ransomware was was you can't you know get away with that. So people are going, you know what? How do we prevent this from happening? So we created standards. We started creating structure behind it, and what we see is more and more we see qualification, vendor qualification. Well, if you're not secure, I'm not going to let you become a vendor of mine, right? The banking industry started to so you know we start seeing this in the in the in the late two thousands actually really the mid two thousand the late two thousands you start seeing more and more companies asking for you to be secure if you're going to do business with me because frankly it started out with the target breach right and kept them going and now you know. 2015 we see even more expansion into this into this concern and so. 
why do we want to create a private cellular infrastructure to secure and segment that, that, that communication? Well, frankly, you now are compliant. And, and lo and behold, if you build this, NIST, and, and we, NIST is our kind of our CYA, you know, you know the CYA for everybody, it needs, you need to find a way to protect yourself, insulate yourself from risk. Well, heck, if I can get a, if I can create, de- deploy a system that is really follows NIST framework, NIST framework is what everybody has used to CYA itself on the side, on the IT side. Well, maybe this is the way to go. And so what we're seeing is this thing called CMMC, and I always forget the, uh, what it stands for, but CMMC basically is the standard the U.S. government is beginning to deploy to create vendor qualification for people who want to do business for the gov- with the government. Well, this is now looking to be used across the entire infrastructure from commercial all the way up to, to government. What this means is you're going to have to get your you know what together. And this leads you to, to understand that the liability that you now are holding is something that is real, not just something you could push away any longer. You know, people uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, were using cyber liability policies to insulate them for potential breaches on the IT side. Well, with all these devices now in the field, how do you do that if you don't know what their security is? Joe, what do you think about that? I mean, that's kind of where you're at, right? Yeah, and, and it's the psychology of IoT. I, I hate the term IoT. Um, I always say it's uh, it's got a network card, it's got a CPU, and it's running software. It's a computer. Uh, but it's a computer that's very rarely patched, very, rare, very rarely uh, scanned for vulnerabilities, and very little maintenance ever done on them. They just kind of set them and forget them. So they all become vectors. So having the ability to segment them and only allow them to do the tasks that you need them to do and block everything else and be told when they're doing something else. I think the IT departments, they're scared to de- Most IT directors I talk to are scared to death of what these devices are doing on their network. And for us to come in and give them clarity that, hey, this is what it's, this is the only thing it's going to do. And if it starts doing anything outside of that, we're going to let you know. And that's all it's allowed to do. I think that's a huge benefit. If, if I'm understanding this, then the costs are lower and you have the security that's built into it, we avoid the issue where most C-level, you know, C-suite folks or security directors wind up going with the cheaper version. So you, you come in, the integrator comes in and has a system and he, want, and, he, and he quotes a price and then you wind up with the guy who installs cameras at, you know, at a gas station. He comes in and he comes in with the cheaper <laughs> price and all of a sudden he, he winds up with it. And then later on, they realize the customer winds up realizing that they have all of these issues and problems. And, you know, maybe that ten, fifteen thousand dollar $15,000 difference in the price tag would have been, you know, the cheap insurance policy to not have to pay fifty, sixty, a hundred thousand dollars $100,000 later to fix a whole bunch of vulnerabilities and mistakes. If we, if we go along with what we've seen historically in the industry, then... Secure PCN would actually take care of both of those issues, both of those sides. You got it. You already bought that. If you bought that cheaper NVR, right? You bought that, you know, whatever brand X NVR that was out there and you've got it sitting in one of your buildings, rather than scrap it, we can we can throw a secure PCN device on there and guarantee that that even if it is vulnerable, it doesn't matter because the only thing it's gonna do is what it's supposed to do, and whatever it's not supposed to do will be blocked and notified. Yeah, and understand, Sal, I'm not going to tell you that I, I, I really do love LSDP, which is a, a security protocol on, on devices. We love all of that. But but frankly, you know, I hate to tell everybody and, and everybody who's listening is that it's a, it's reality, right? With millions of d- devices out there, I mean, you, I can, I, there's no way all of those devices are going to become secure. It's just not going to happen. And Frankly, there is no way to have a control on those devices at that point. Now, you do have the, the aspect of compliance, right? So, so you have the, the question mark of, of vendor qualification, vendor compliance. Are you secure? Are you, is your product secure? And at the end of the day, now, with when we're creating OEM relationships with access control companies and, and product companies, and they're saying, look, 
you know, why can't we bundle the, the secure PCN with the with the technology so that we know we're we're cyber secure? We are cyber secure and, and communicating uh, securely. So here's the interesting part, guys, and I think this is one part that I think we have to talk about is the 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 birth of 5G and what does that mean in terms of connectivity almost instantaneously to everything and not having any barriers at all to the communication platform. Well, we know that there are companies and there are agencies and there are agencies all over the world that are, are you meaning government agencies that are asking for 5G connected or 5G ready devices. And this is what the future is And the 5G is to get on the cellular network, correct? So we've gone through, you know, 3G, 4G. Now 5G is what you see the commercials on. Yeah. I mean, now we're not there yet. I mean, you know, the only connected device is a Huawei device, which is not accepted really um, and is not acceptable in the U.S. But the reality is, is that that our device is actually 5G ready. It's CAT6. It's ready to go. It just needs that one last chip, that la- that that next step where everybody's accepting it. Um, but frankly, we're on the 4G, the LTE. We're all already connected on that infrastructure. So, you know, um, that's yeah. It's it's it does. This is the future. This is today. Well, today it is today. Well, and given it is going to be the give, future. Given sure. the fact that it solves the security problems. And it also brings in economic benefits. It, it really does, you know, it really is in the sweet spot of where, you know, the, the end to sea level uh, C-suite, the end users, the manufacturers of the edge devices, the consultants and the integrators. We're all aligned in, um, in seeing the benefits here. So I really think it really comes down to just education of the industry and of, uh, and of end user companies and, and to have them understand, you know, the the vulnerabilities that they've had to date, you know, utilizing the internet, and that uh, going in this direction does not, uh, you know, does not abdicate, you know, the benefits that the internet brought, but it 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 is a sure way of uh, of solving the security vulnerabilities. So, you know, it's a big education process at this point. Pierre, I got a quick question. I need a thirty second answer, and I realize how difficult this could be, but a quick thirty <laughs> second answer. The Safety Act was a standard that never took hold and provided a whole bunch of liability protections that nobody took. What do you think about Secure PCN? Is it something that works with it, next to it, or works you know, on top of it? Where, where does it position itself? It props it up. It basically gives it the teeth that it never, or the, the, it, didn't, it gives it the technology that it never had. I think the Safety Act was to secure those buildings and and to ensure communication. We didn't have that. It was too costly, right? We have Safe Harbor Acts the same way, and Ohio Safe Harbor is very similar to the Safety Act. And I think that what it boils down to is that secure PCN, in effect, gives you the way to get it enacted and actually make it happen. And it never just it never had the tools to do it. It was too expensive, you know. You know how it is. If you have, don't have something that's easy to install, less expensive, and secure, you're not gonna, it's just not going to happen. People aren't going to pay for it. Yeah, I think one. I think with the especially with the safety act, it was facilities would have were having difficulty being able to obtain the safety act designations, even just for the, the, the construction of the properties. And a couple of right. our clients have had that where you can get you can actually get safety act designation on the facility. But you needed to have all of that infrastructure in place to be able to do it. And this is probably a good addition to it, something that they should you be looked at. I totally yeah. agree. Totally agree, Sal. Joe and Pierre, uh, really appreciate you uh, spending the, the time with us today. Uh, how will our listeners uh, best contact you? Uh, you know, actually, you can get us, uh, first of all, go to our website, esiconvergent.com or securepcn.com. That's how you can get both our advisory or our consulting firm, as well as uh, securepcn.com. You can get Pierre um, at esiconvergent.com, uh, Jay, Pin, uh, Jay Pinner at uh, esiconvergent.com and securepcn.com, correct? So, yeah, um, there, you go to our website. Uh, all of it is uh, there for your look. You can look, peruse, and and take a look at our costs, our pricing, and it gives you really a good understanding of how this is put together. Uh, we have a, a great team of people. We've got uh, a great management team. We've got great service uh, team. Um, so 
uh, we're we're uh, we're in, we're doing business today, and we're really uh, you know taking the order. So it's it's really happening in a big way. Well, I very much appreciate your time, and I'd also say that uh, in our show notes uh, associated with uh, the program, uh, there is a um, there is file there on a on a on a document that uh, Secure PCN has uh, prepared uh, that addresses particularly the applications for uh, for CISOs. You have been listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and Sal Freire. We ask you to subscribe to this show and like us on our social media uh, sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. Also, if you know someone that would be a great guest, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com and make your suggestion. Remember, you can hear the show on your favorite podcast platform, uh, YouTube, and of course, stream at theriskadvisor.com. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you tune in again next week.